Legend has it that vegetables were better before. So we are going to go back in time and visit the hallowed French Academy of Agriculture. Where you can find the ghost of vegetables past. Between two old pamphlets on farming, we stumble across a hidden jam. The food composition table from 60 years ago. It shows the exact amount of vitamins and minerals that every fruit and vegetable contained at the time of writing. So we came up with a very simple idea to compare these old statistics with those of today. This information is no longer kept in old paper books. It is now kept on the internet. We discovered a little known fact. Fruit and vegetables have lost some of their vitamins and minerals. Take green beans, for example. In 1960, they contained 65 milligrams of calcium for every 100 grams. In 2017, they contain no more than 48.5 milligrams, that's a quarter less calcium. The same thing for vitamin C, 19 milligrams at the time versus 13.6 today. One by one, we examined the 70 most consumed fruit and vegetables and compiled the results into this table. The results show a dramatic deterioration. In the space of 60 years, all 70 fruit and vegetables have lost an average of 16% of their calcium, 27% of their vitamin C, and almost less than half of their iron levels. For several years now, an American researcher has been warning us about this loss of nutrients. So, I'm here to tell you about an important problem that many people are not aware of, nutritional declines in foods. Donald Davis is a biochemist. He has worked at the University of Austin, Texas. We showed him our comparative table. This looks like similar to what we find in US data and UK data. So what do you think? In the United States, Donald Davis uh, analyzed the development of 43 vegetables between 1950 and 1999. I think that most of these declines are caused by increases in yield. When yields go up, there's less nutrients per weight of the food. A lot of agricultural scientists uh, may not know about how big these effects are. This is kind of an embarrassing of their, they're always wanting to increase yield. If modern breeding was causing increases in flavor and increases in nutrients, I think they would talk about it a lot more. The tomato is one of the fruits that has seen the largest drop in nutrients, a quarter of its calcium and more than half of its vitamins. In order to understand this decline, we must trace fruit and vegetables back to their origin. Before the fruit even grows, the seed determines everything. Tomato farmers choose their seeds from these brochures. They are published by manufacturers such as Syngenta, Vilmorin or Claus. To attract farmers, they mention their size, shape, color and, in particular, their productivity. But most importantly are the letters, HF1, which signifies a first-generation hybrid. And that's how we get a hybrid. For example, let's take a plant that grows large but very pale tomatoes. We crossed them with a plant whose tomatoes are red but too small. 
By combining these two varieties, we create what is called a hybrid, a plant that possesses both the genes of a large tomato and a bright red tomato. For 50 years, scientists from all over the world have been developing these hybridizations to create tomatoes that can withstand all sorts of bumps and bruises. You've heard of crash tests on cars. Here are crash test tomatoes. During the 1980s, these laboratory tomatoes flooded the market. But there is still one problem that no one has managed to work out. Tomatoes spoil very quickly. Until the day scientists invent the eternal tomato. This miraculous tomato has been created in Israel. For 70 years, this country has revolutionized the farming industry. It has managed to grow fruit and vegetables in the middle of the desert. We met one of the fathers of the modern tomato at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the man who made this fruit practically immortal. Nice to see you. Yes. Hi. You Good morning. Haim Ramidovic. Uh, we go straight to the farm. Yes. At 79 years old, Professor Rabinovich continues to develop future hybrids. This is a breeding greenhouse, so each plant is different. And I say, wow, this plant it looks stronger than this one, for instance, and definitely more than this one. We look for these differences in order to develop something which is better than the existing material. The best tomatoes are those that are well adapted for commercial production. Because although the researcher and his assistant may well be university lecturers, they also work for private corporations. Their research is currently funded by French seed company Vilmorin. It's owned by them. I cannot, I cannot give it to anybody else. This is yeah, exclusive, exclusive, to, to, exclusive to them. You're the only one that got into this greenhouse. Beside you, no one can get it. Mm -hmm. They need to develop a tomato for southern European countries. Here there is a big one, look. Phil Moreno looking uh, to have a, a winning hybrid in the Balkan market, which have a fruit size around 300 grams. Tomatoes as big as grapefruits that must grow on horizontal vines. This is the, the cluster which the flower are organized. Mm. Usually the cluster has three dimensions. The fruit grow in every possible direction. Uh, people like today what we call a fishbone cluster. From packing point of view, if you have three dimension, it's very difficult to pack in a box. When you have a two dimension, you can put one on top of the other and it's much easier. To create this hybrid, they have to cross two plants by placing pollen from one plant onto the flower of another. Here's the way you extract pollen. You need to come to the open flower. This is what we call artificial bee. Actually, you know what it is? It's an electric toothbrush. And we just re remove the brush and put a hook on top of it. You can see at the bottom, you can see yellow, yellow dust. And in two days, I will come with the pollen and I will make the pollination. Uh... How many crossings you make for uh, to have one hybrid at, at the end? To make a commercial hybrid? Probably 400. 400 like that? Yes. 400 every year. Sometimes it's coming only from the third year. So it, you can go to a huge numbers. That is how, after thousands of cross-pollinations in the early 1990s, Haim Rabinovich and his colleagues invented the eternal tomato. This innovation has transformed the world market. Where you begin to work on the long shelf life? Because, because of this waste of 40% of the, of the yield. Uh, before this mutation, uh, the limit was two, three days, four days at the most. 
When we exported tomatoes to Europe, and we exported a lot of tomatoes, we used to fly it by airplanes. Because if it has to go by boat from Israel to Marseille, the tomato will be mushy. Nobody, nobody will touch it. To extend its shelf life, the professor had to defy the laws of nature. The purpose of this tomato is to disseminate the seed for the next generation. So the moment the seeds are ripe, it will fall off the bush, bump into the ground, explode, and all this juice will, will run all over as far away from the mother plant as possible in order to conquer more territory. We don't want it. It's undesired trait for human beings. And here we have a mutation that seemingly can provide a solution. Here is the Israeli researchers' idea. They have cross-pollinated a plant with regular tomatoes that decay within three days, with a plant carrying a natural genetic defect that prevents the ripening of the fruit. They have thus ended up with a long-lasting hybrid tomato that, once picked, will decay much slower. We led our own homegrown experiment. On one side, we have a hybrid fruit with a perfect appearance. On the other side, an heirloom tomato that has not undergone any hybridization with its speckled yellow skin and other small imperfections. Now, all we have to do is wait. After three days, the two tomatoes still look completely fine. But after a week, the heirloom tomato is no longer fit for sale because of these little black marks. Within two weeks, it even starts to go moldy. And what about the hybrid? Unaffected. In two weeks, it has not changed at all. Except for one thing, the stem comes off. It was only after day 25 that the hybrid became unsellable, now with mold and softer skin. Without hybridization, it would have looked like this. Its shelf life has therefore gone from three days to almost three weeks. But just like any deal for eternal youth, there is a price to pay. You can taste them. Tasteless. The genes for uh, inhibition, ripening inhibition, carry with them some negative traits. Uh, for instance, flavor. The taste deteriorates. And we are less nutrient, but... In I don't know because we ne never measured it. Only later, in the 90s and the early 2000s, we started looking into the quality traits. I offered a project like that to many seed companies. I even gave it a name. I called it Ace Tomato. Why Ace? Vitamin A, C, and E. And I said it will be much healthier tomato. We don't have it in um, supermarkets, this variety. The industry, they don't care. These manufacturers that Haim Rabinovich refers to are big names in the seed industry such as the business Hazera, which has earned millions thanks to the long-life tomato. In 2003, this Israeli company was bought out by Limagran, a multinational corporation with a turnover of over two and a half billion dollars. After acquiring Hazera, the company became the world's second biggest producer of tomato seeds. Hazera test out their new varieties in the Negev desert, out in the middle of nowhere. Jaron Giras is global head of the tomato department. Jael Rosenfeld is head of the communications department. <laughs> this is for you, and then you put the, those two. This is our protocol for sanitation.
The 120 varieties in this demonstration greenhouse are advertised right down to their stem. I'm going to show you, for example, uh, tomatoes that we call it lamia. This is a very famous uh, tomato uh, in Turkey today. It's the green part of the tomatoes. It's like a moustache, you know? There is a special gene for uh, this moustache. Uh, yes, yes. So you see very, very nice uh, color, very firm tomato. It's coming from the long shelf life uh, family also. Um, you mean uh, it has a long shelf life family? Genes, uh, yeah. Genes? Inside, What yeah. is the percentage of all your variety that has long uh, shelf life? I, I didn't calculate, but I assume today around 50-50. Uh, long shelf life has a problem for the taste. Long shelf life, in, in, for, for a long time, we saw that it was influenced to reduce the taste of the tomato. And now we are going back and mm. try to increase the taste again of the tomato. And Yaron Giras wants to prove it to us. In his opinion, the long life gene doesn't necessarily mean a lack of flavor. You like tomato? Yeah. <laughs> Not everybody likes tomatoes, you know? Yes, I like tomatoes. But it's, it's hard to find a good tomato right now, nowadays. Okay. <laughs> Taste? Okay. Like a little bit um, We said, acid, we said uh, not all the tomato need to have a taste because if you add olive oil and salt, you don't need taste. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I tell you, I, I, I know what is tomato. Toma this is okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's a... There is a worse. <laughs> but yeah. for the market and for what they want, this is okay. I'm going to show you some tomatoes that you said, wow. And I want you to taste uh, this uh, special Maggie and to tell me if there you feel the difference. No. What do you think? Different, a different taste. It's mm -hmm. not good as I want it to be. Yeah. Because it's starting. Mm -hmm. the, cu the cultivation is start. Yes. You <laughs> see, you are the same people. We will come back to the taste, but what about the nutrients? Very little gel. What we're looking more and more is uh, to have a good color, mm -hmm. uh, a good firmness, and a good taste. And, and uh, the nutrients in tomato are still, it's a small player in the market. With, For um, cooking in Italy. Steam, no? For cooking. Is the hybridization of tomatoes one of the reasons for the loss of nutrients? In the south of France, in Belgar du Razès, Jean-Luc Borol is one of the last artisan seed sellers in the country. Using his own tomatoes, he produces non-hybrid seeds. These are heirloom seeds. On va finir d'extraire les semences. Donc euh, les graines, elles vont euh, être au fond, elles vont pouvoir couler, et les peaux vont rester euh, flotter au-dessus. Cette technique-là de, de faire ses propres semences, tout le monde le faisait avant, parce que euh, chaque agriculteur savait que de la semence dépendaient les futures récoltes. Donc c'était vraiment quelque chose que chaque agriculteur faisait avec soin, simplement parce que ne serait-ce que pour pouvoir manger. Bah, il fallait vraiment euh, le plus important, c'est la semence. Et maintenant, ils le font plus parce que il euh, y a des grandes entreprises qui le font pour eux. Donc c'est un geste devenu un peu rare. Euh, ouais, presque hérétique. In his greenhouse, Jean-Luc Brawl only grows farmer's varieties. 100% natural farming. Effectivement, c'est un peu le bazar. Après, ça donne une impression de bazar parce que j'ai une toute petite surface et que pour rentabiliser cette petite surface, je serre beaucoup les tomates. Je travaille dans la terre, ce qui fait que moi, je mets aucun produit chimique. Je mets aucun produit d'ailleurs. Dans la serre, là, il doit y avoir à peu près une, euh, une vingtaine de variétés. 
de tomates. Qu'est-ce qu'elles ont en commun, toutes ces tomates C'est des variétés qui ne sont pas hybrides. Donc ça veut dire qu'il n'y a pas eu des croisements. Do these farmers varieties contain more nutrients than hybrids? We are going to analyze them. On one side, we have Jean-Luc's tomatoes. On the other, a hybrid with a similar appearance bought from the supermarket. The very same day, we sent them to an accredited laboratory to measure their nutrient levels. Three weeks later, the results arrive. The hybrid tomato contains a significantly lower level of the five nutrients analyzed. It contains 63% less calcium, 29% less magnesium, and 72% less vitamin C. The levels of lycopene and polyphenols, two antioxidants that help fight cardiovascular diseases, are two times lower in the hybrid than in the farmer's variety tomato. We then showed these analyses to Donald Davis, a specialist in nutrient loss. Congratulations. Okay. How's the taste? Is the taste different? Of course. Uh -huh. The heirloom one was very, very good. I ate it like a candy. <laughs> but the hybrid was uh, tasteless, yes, of course. It's consistent with the idea that there is a relationship between taste and nutrient content. This was published by Professor Clay at the University of Florida, and he made the observation in this paper that many of the flavor components of tomatoes are derived from human nutrients. When you eat a tomato that has good flavor, that means that it probably also had uh, good amounts of the nutrients that were used to make that flavor. It's a consequence of hybridization? It's consistent with all of the other evidence. Uh, breeders select for yield, but they are also looking for other economic traits. And in the process of making that change, they also caused a change in the chemistry of the tomato. Hybrid varieties are less nutritious. So what does Le Magrin, owner of Hazira and the world's second largest tomato seed producer, think of this? Jean-Christophe Gouache is one of the company's board members. Vous êtes un des très hauts responsables de l'Imagrin, qui est un des leaders mondiaux du marché de la semence. Est-ce que vous avez mesuré les nutriments dans vos tomates C'est important ce que vous, la question que vous posez, parce qu'il euh, faut euh, regarder c'est quoi la... Qu'est-ce qui fait la qualité nutritionnelle euh, d'une tomate oui. ou la composition sur les éléments que vous avez mis Ce sont essentiellement les conditions de culture beaucoup plus que la variété. Est-ce que vous êtes en train de me dire que c'est un problème qui ne nous concerne pas Oh, jamais, jamais de la vie. La qualité nutritionnelle des produits issus des variétés que nous commercialisons est un sujet qui nous intéresse. Euh, en Israël, justement, on a rencontré le professeur euh, Rabinovitch. Oui. Vous le connaissez Absolument. Euh, vous savez très bien que c'est lui qui a inventé euh, la tomate longue durée, donc c'est une tomate qui dure trois semaines Oui. Euh, il nous a expliqué que le, le gène de longue durée euh, bloque euh, en partie la maturation du fruit euh, et donc, euh, du coup, le développement des nutriments. Mais on est ambitieux. Il va falloir qu'on soit capable... Les consommateurs nous demandent des tomates qui ont du goût mmh. et des caractéristiques de conservation qui sont également attendues par le, par le consommateur et par le maraîcher et par l'ensemble de la chaîne de valeur. Mais alors justement, on se dit que si demain, dans les supermarchés, il y avait un scanner à nutriments, et donc euh, si en tant que consommateur, moi, je pouvais passer mes, ton mes tomates au scanner et savoir immédiatement s'il y avait des nutriments ou pas dedans, vous, en tant que producteur de semences, vous diriez peut-être, ah, si le consommateur alors, peut le savoir, peut-être qu'il faut qu'on s'en occupe. L'important, euh, c'est de manger plus de légumes pour nos concitoyens, en termes d'équilibre alimentaire. Maintenant, euh, si vous voulez, s'il y a un jour, euh, je, je ne sais pas quelle est la science-fiction qui fera que le consommateur pourra avoir un scanner à nutriments. C'est en développement en fait, hein. ça va exister bientôt. 
Euh, mais là, du coup, s'il y avait ça, peut-être que vous en occuperiez plus. Je, je, je vais rester cohérent avec ce que je vous ai dit. Je pense que les producteurs de tomates qui ont le plus gros impact sur la, sur la composition des tomates auraient à s'en occuper au premier chef et plus rapidement que nous parce que c'est eux qui ont l'impact le plus important. The hybrids offer another great advantage for seed suppliers. Their seeds are single use. If you plant the seed of a hybrid plant, the genes mix, and when the plant grows, it's the luck of the draw. The tomatoes could be small, striped, or misshapen. This is why farmers must buy more seeds every year. A profitable market, given that the manufacturers sell these tomato seeds at a very high price, like Limagrin in Israel. How much is one kilo of seeds of this kind of tomato? Ah, this kind of tomato today can reach uh, the 400,000 euro. What? For kilogram of seeds. What? 400,000 euro. Or more. Yes, you can buy a house with this. I've heard that the tomato seed is the more capital gain of all the seeds. Yes, yeah. uh, the margin, uh, or our margin is the highest that, uh, that we can get in tomato. Why? Because it's expensive, expensive seeds, and there is a lot of demands. So uh, it's, a, yeah, it's a good business for us. If it's not, we are not here. The small yellow tomato, the most expensive variety in the greenhouse, costs $450,000 for every kilo of seeds. Even so, for a basic tomato, it is $67,000, double the price of gold. This is a hand, uh, really, to uh, hand work. Uh, they need a lot of labor to, to make uh, seeds. And where do you produce the, the seeds? The like we told you today, in 22 different countries today, mm -hmm. all over the world. And uh, like which kind of country? Like, uh... like Israel, like uh, in Thailand, like in uh, Chile, in Spain, in uh, India, in many places. Seeds sold for the price of gold and produced by hand in countries with cheap labor. Welcome to the era of seed globalization. The tomato trail has led us to India. It was this report with a young girl on the front cover that prompted us to take the flight. Soil Seeds, commissioned in 2015 by ICN, a Dutch NGO. In the seed sector, 16% of workers that produce vegetable seeds are children under the age of 14 years. These seeds are produced in the state of Karnataka, in remote villages that are amongst the poorest in the whole country. Here, the climate is mild for vegetables. Every year, 160,000 kilos of tomato seeds are produced to then be exported. The five biggest multinational seed companies can be found here on this plane. BASF, Dupont, Bayer Monsanto, Syngenta, and Limagran. We are going to travel across it, together with the Hindu god Ganesh and one of the researchers from this NGO that works against child labor. In India, working before the age of 14 is illegal. Raviraj roams the area to count the children in the fields. Along with our translator, we approach the children. These young girls have been hollowing out watermelons for hours in order to remove the seeds. It is 86 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade. These girls have been recruited by a farmer who works for an Indian seed company. Ah, you know, on Salpa Cortion Terra, Sumaran Ayotoko, Kurbadan Sutte. 
According to Ravi in Karnataka, the tomato hybrid industry is one of the largest employers of child labor. It's the end of the season. The fields are almost deserted, but a little further we notice some figures through the screens of this greenhouse. This farm is a subcontractor of the Swiss multinational Syngenta. Around 10 workers prune the tomato plants. A girl who is smaller than the others stares at us. The young girl on the left quietly tells her to bend down. Is this young lady 17 years old? Our translator finds this hard to believe. I don't think she is 17. Looking at her, uh, probably she is much younger than 17, so, which is very much uh, apparent that you know, she has been trying to hide her age. In Karnataka, 800 farms have a contract with Syngenta. It's the largest foreign contracting party. Naturally, we asked the Swiss multinational its thoughts on child labor. In response, an empty rhetoric of principles. Syngenta conforms to all labor laws. Syngenta's equitable work policy promotes decent working conditions and also tackles the problem of child labor. Why are children hired by farmers that work for these big seed companies? Dr. Davuluri Ventakesvalu, author of the report Soiled Seeds, is one of the main experts on child labor in India. For 15 years, this independent research worker has been investigating the production sector of hybrid seeds. The hybridization activity is very, very delicate. It requires a lot of uh, uh, skills. The children are preferred because they can do this repetitive activities very uh, faster than adults. Uh, and also, uh, they, they are more obedient, uh, we can say. Two children can do the work of three adults. Uh, that is the kind of calculation farmers have. According to this researcher, farmers cut wages for one simple reason, the low prices set by the multinationals. The farmers are struggling, actually, to have a uh, good profit margin uh, if they have to uh, uh, hire labor and pay good remuneration to the workers. The, the margin will be very nominal or sometimes there won't be any margin for the farmers. Davuluri Venkateswalu's battle has begun to pay off. The proportion of children working in the seed industry under the age of 14 has been reduced from 16 to 10 percent. But another part of the population is still being exploited. Travelling through Karnataka, we made another discovery. In the tomato seed fields, we only saw women. We found out why during our visit to Chaman Gauda Doda Goda's farm. Tomato for who? HM class. Two hundred, three hundred twenty. In India, Limagrin operates under the name HM Clause. The French seed company is in contract with 600 farmers in the region. 
crossing running Bent over under the blazing sun, these women remove the pollen from flowers with tweezers for eight hours a day. Their heads buried in pollen and fertilizers for just $2.80 a day. It is not much, and what's more, it is illegal. In India, employers must comply with the minimum wage. It is 330 rupees in the agricultural industry, the equivalent of $4.80 a day. These women therefore earn 40% less than the legal minimum wage. These farmers say they are forced to break the law because they need another $30 per kilo. Yet in Europe, Limagrin sells a kilo of seeds for an average of $67,000. Are the local Limagrin managers aware of these illegal practices? The following day, we decided to take a little visit to the Indian branch of HM Claws with a hidden camera. We got off to a bad start. They stopped us before we even got close to the building. You are looking for seeds coming? Yes, yes. That's What's the purpose? What? Purpose, purpose. We make a documentary about the uh, seeds in uh, Karnataka. So Europe means which country particularly? Uh, France. Oh, okay. One minute. Apparently, being French, like Limagrin, has its benefits. We are invited to enter the staff office. Ah, okay, Limagrin. To speak Hello. directly with the supervisor. Okay. The man is on the phone with head office. Because uh, we have very strict information, uh, instruction from uh, head office, not to allow any people. They are banned from speaking to us, but do not underestimate the famous Indian hospitality. Shall I have lunch first? Lunch? Maybe you never know. Okay, we'll have to. Okay, we'll have to. We go inside the storage facility where the seeds produced by the Indian farmers are dried before being exported. The site managers admit they are fully aware that the farmers do not abide by the minimum wage of $4.80 a day. What is the salary for one worker? 200 rupees. Okay, for eight hours. Okay. More shocking information. According to this executive, the firm even violates this law with its own employees. How much are paid uh, in uh, HM Close Farm? According to the supervisor, the business has a knack for hiding the price of seeds in Europe from the farmers. What are the name of a tomato? It is very secret. We put uh, numbers. numbers. Production people, uh, we should not know mm. the names. Why? Suppose uh, mm. you come to know that uh, this product is very popular and uh, is uh, produced uh, by this name. So what is Limagrin doing to combat these illicit practices? Ouais. Alors, est-ce que vous connaissez le rapport qui s'appelle Soiled Seeds? Il est ici. 
Oui. Ouais, il, a, il a donc été rédigé en 2015 sur le travail Absolument. des enfants et l'exploitation euh, des femmes. Et alors ici, vous allez voir, page 6, donc je vous le montre là, euh, la part des enfants de moins de 14 ans varie entre 10,5 et 16,3%, donc de tous les gens qui travaillent, notamment dans les fermes de Limagrin. La première chose que je souhaite vous dire, que je souhaite dire, affirmer haut et fort, il n'y a pas de travail des enfants sur les sites de l'Imagrin. Mais chez vos sous-traitants, lorsque... chez vos sous-traitants qui travaillent pour l'Imagrin en Inde, est-ce que vous nous affirmez qu'il n'y a pas de travail d'enfants Nous sommes passés de ces 10 à 15 et, et ce n'est pas parfait, à moins de 1 Et donc toutes les mesures ont été prises. Lesquelles Des mesures contractuelles, ouais. d'interdiction du travail des enfants, tout un travail de formation et d'éducation, euh, de sensibilisation et ensuite allant jusqu'à des sanctions pour être certain, euh, autant que faire se peut, que le travail des enfants n'existe pas. Autant que faire se peut. Le, le travail des enfants, Madame Nusset, c'est trop sérieux ce, que, ce sujet-là. Non, non, mais c'est très sérieux, c'est pour ça qu'on qu qu vous pose Une tolérance zéro, Madame Lucet. Est-ce que nous pouvons, dans un territoire comme l'Inde, avoir toutes les certitudes Probablement non. Mais la détermination, elle est sans faille, Madame Lucet. Dans les femmes qui travaillent pour vous, euh, on a vu que les femmes sont toutes payées en dessous du minimum légal, c'est-à-dire 2,50 euros par jour contre 4,25 euros euh, le salaire minimum. Un, un commentaire ce je, je ne peux pas euh, être d'accord avec ce commentaire. L'immigrant. Avec ce chiffre Absolument. Mais on l'a vu sur le terrain Je, je, je m'inscris en faux sur cette réalité. Ah Maintenant, ben non. Je, je suis certain de notre engagement. D'accord. Parce que moi, je vais vous dire autre chose. Vous vous dites, mais les salariés de l'immigrant, ils sont payés au salaire légal euh, en Inde. Minimum légal, je vous le rappelle, 4,25 euros par jour en Inde. D'accord Les salariés de l'immigrant, ils sont payés 3,60 euros. Et ça, ça nous a été confirmé par un responsable de l'Imagrin. Les salariés de l'Imagrin, partout où nous opérons, sont payés au minimum légal ou au-dessus du minimum légal. Vous êtes allé en Inde dernièrement euh, Je suis allé en Inde plusieurs fois. Mais dernièrement non, ce je, n'est je, pas dans mes fonctions aujourd'hui d'aller en Inde. Parce que nous, on y allait dernièrement et c'est les chiffres sur le terrain pour le coup. La réalité de terrain, Madame Lucet, nous la connaissons. Je, 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 je m'inscris en faux sur, ce, sur cette affirmation. Nowadays, it's almost impossible to find seeds that have not been hybridized or cloned by the industry. Corn, vegetables, rice, wheat, sunflowers, the same modern and uniform plants are being imposed all over the world. As a result, two-thirds of all seeds sold in the world now belong to four multinationals. Bayer Monsanto, Do Dupont, Syngenta, and Limagran. This privatization of nature is destroying biodiversity. In 2009, a man launched a global appeal to the United Nations. At the time, Olivier Descouter was a United Nations Special Rapporteur on the right to food. 75% of agrobiodiversity has been lost um, as a result of the pressure towards the adoption of uniform improved variety. We are meeting him at his home in Brussels. Despite his calm demeanor, C'est le bon sens agronomique, quoi. The former UN Special Rapporteur is frustrated that his warnings are falling on deaf ears. C'est un chiffre alarmant, c'est 75% de, de plantes qu'on a perdu, parce que la biodiversité n'est pas juste un luxe de botaniste, c'est essentiel à, à la sécurité alimentaire mondiale. Pourquoi Parce qu'on ne peut pas anticiper à l'avenir le type d'insectes ravageurs qui va se développer, le type de maladie qui peut affecter les plantes, les impacts qu'auront les ruptures climatiques. On a besoin de ce réservoir de solutions pour l'avenir pour faire face à ces menaces que, par définition, l'on ne peut pas entièrement anticiper. Fragile plants is not such a bad thing for the large seed companies. Because out of these four multinationals that dominate the world seed market, three are pesticide manufacturers. 
Bayern Monsanto, Dor Dupont and Syngenta. La grande difficulté face à laquelle nous sommes, c'est que les agriculteurs reçoivent une sorte de package. On leur dit, si vous achetez ces semences, ça marche mieux avec ces pesticides, ou ça ne marche qu'avec ces pesticides, et ça marche mieux avec ces engrais. Et donc, on va développer des semences réactives aux intrants. Seeds are a perfect Trojan horse for these chemical products. As a result, 3 million tons of pesticides are sold annually worldwide. À terme, on va manger la même chose de Dakar à Miami, de, de Paris à Bangkok. En gros, c'est ça le, le monde de demain vu par les semenciers Pendant euh, des millénaires, l'on avait des semences euh, en quantité, euh, en variété très grande. Et euh, ces semences étaient améliorées au fil des récoltes, année après année, par les paysans, euh, euh, par des méthodes qu'on pourrait qualifier aujourd'hui d'artisanales. Progressivement, ce travail de sélection et de reproduction a été fait par des firmes spécialisées qui du coup ont mis sur le marché des, des semences permettant de produire des volumes importants euh, de produits agricoles génétiquement identiques. La diffusion à l'échelle mondiale des semences industrielles euh, dont les droits sont détenus par une poignée de grandes firmes transnationales euh, signifie que pour beaucoup de petits paysans et des pays en développement, l'agriculture ne sera tout simplement plus viable. Et donc on va assister à une progressive destruction de l'agriculture paysanne à l'échelle mondiale. Today, across the world, citizens and farmers alike are revolting against this program disappearance. They demand free seeds, seeds that do not belong to the giants of the agrochemical industry. In France, a number of people are organizing the resistance. In the southwest of the country, in the depth of a valley, you will find the hideout of Cocopelli. Ananda Guyer runs this non-profit organization. They are trying to protect traditional and forgotten vegetable varieties. Their collection includes 2,400 vegetables that are now rare, such as this beige-colored cucumber puna kera or orange Swiss chard. En fait, il y a une diversité de couleurs complètement incroyable, et, euh, et en fait, la standardisation de l'agriculture, elle a vraiment, elle a vraiment fait le syndrome de l'entonnoir sur les espèces et, et les côtes de blette, en l'occurrence. Euh, pour à peu près tout le monde, une côte de bled, c'est soit vert, soit blanc, généralement blanc, à large carte, etc. Alors qu'il y a une diversité complètement incroyable de côtes de bled et qui peuvent donner euh, des couleurs de l'arc-en-ciel comme ça, qu'on n'a pas du tout l'habitude de voir. To help with the preservation of these varieties, Cocopelli has launched the scheme Seeds Without Frontiers. C'est de là que tous les colis pour la, les campagnes de solidarité comme Semences Sans Frontières euh, sont expédiés. Donc on envoie tous les ans des centaines de colis partout sur la planète avec des petites fiches techniques. Ça, c'est des retours en fait de plein de projets qu'on a soutenus. Quel pays Oula, mais là, il y, a, il y a quasiment tous les pays. On en a en Inde, on en a en Amérique centrale, en Amérique du Sud, un peu partout en Asie aussi. Enfin, vraiment, euh... en fait, ces populations ont été totalement asservies par les multinationales de l'agrochimie, la, de l'agroalimentaire. La Et du coup, ils perdent toute leur variété hyper vite, des fois en l'espace d'une ou deux saisons. Et donc nous, ce qu'on fait, euh, mais on est tout petit face à ces multinationales, donc c'est une action assez modeste, mais qui porte quand même ses fruits. La preuve euh, ici, avec tous ces retours, euh, on ramène euh, ces variétés-là et surtout on ramène le savoir avec, euh, modestement encore. On n'a pas la prétention d'avoir la science infuse, mais en tout cas, on essaye de les aider euh, à retrouver cette autonomie alimentaire via la reproduction de semences. By conserving these endangered seeds, we are taking back the choice to plant or eat non-standardized fruit and vegetables, which are the best produce for both our planet and our health. But perhaps most importantly, we will liberate the vibrant common good of humanity.